She's a pediatrician at Intermountain's Holiday Clinic. She began her commitment to community in the National Health Service Corps. She was a driving force in getting Intermountain to require lead testing in children this year, and she was the lead physician on the Sandy Water Crisis this last winter. So let's all welcome Dr. Harris. All right, thank you all so much. So I have to say that um, <laughs> I have nothing to disclose other than the queen of the deep end and queen of overshares. So when I share my email, I really do mean it. Please reach out if you choose to start implementing the lead testing in your organization and you're um, hitting barriers, you have questions, you have feedback, please just, you know, you can email me and just let me know where I need to be and I'll be there. And should I be wearing sneakers or boardroom attire? Just let me know. And I have to say, I reached out to one of my friends. I was like, y'all, I have to go after Mira G. Brown. <laughs> oh my gosh. Like she is it when it comes to lead. She was the person that I reached out to, um, one of the many resources I reached out to during the Sandy Water event. And I was like, I have to go after her. And so my friend, she told me, she's like, you know what, just get up here and tell your story. So this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna tell the story of how this came to um, fruition. And so this is my family, I'm the baby. And so this gives you a lot of detail about where I come from. So I come from a long line of stubborn women, but we love standing up for each other. We love standing up for family and community, and we love advocating for others, um, and especially reaching out to those in need. And nobody, I mean nobody, mess with me, Ma. That's the person who's holding me right there. So I grew up with kind of with my dukes up, if you need help. I'm there for you, and I'm there for you in the deep end. So prior to moving to Utah, this is where I was at. I was in Camden. A lot of people will look at Camden, and they will see poverty. They will see despair. They will see no hope, no future. However, I saw a city invincible. Thank you, Walt Whitman. I saw just vibrancy and the most lovely people you ever imagined. But I also saw the highest level of lead I've ever seen in 82. So unfortunately, it was housing. Um, it was a not so great landlord. Um, so that's where I kind of fell in love with preventing lead poisoning and reaching out to these families and knowing that I can make a difference in their lives. So there, I served on the Camden City Lead Coalition. And so when I moved to Utah, they're like, hey, lead lady, do you want to sit on the, uh, be the Intermountain Lead Coalition person? I was like, sure. I'm on it, let's do this. And so I know what you're asking already. Well, that's nice, Liz, that was Camden. That's New Jersey, but this is Utah. And we don't have lead here, do we? Not at all, right? So before I even joined the practice, um, a couple things already happened. So Dr. Furman actually came to our practice and given a lecture, and Dr. Jessica Wagner, it's the power of yes. Just takes one person, one person to practice say yes. One person to get it going, she says, yeah. Yeah, we need to be doing this. And it's a federal mandate for the Medicaid kids. We should be doing this. So she was able to get one of the analyzers. Then I came aboard. I was like, yeah, yes, we should be doing this. So now we're getting more momentum. And then I went to the administration. <laughs> I'm the squeakiest wheel you will ever meet. And um, so they said, OK, true. We haven't been really testing our Medicaid children. And let's answer this question together. Do we have an issue with lead in Utah? So um, the administration got the point of care testing for all the 18 Intermountain Pediatric Practices. Um, we participated in, in the national AEP uh, lead testing echo that just happened this past January to July. Um, it's gonna mirror what the Utah AEP is gonna offer. Y'all, it's easy peasy, lemon squeezy, as if you need the MO4 credit, MOC4. Um, so out of the 18 practices, nine chose to participate and 51 pediatricians got a credit. So Dr. Sean Soison is the mastermind behind all these amazing slides and the heat maps that are about to follow. Because it's one thing to put your passion into practice and something altogether different to put it into a format where you can really digest it. So you can see here, this is our baseline. Set of 18 practices, we were testing meh, maybe 200 a month. And this is where we kicked off the AP Echo. 
You can see it took some of our practices a little bit of ramp up time, and now we're testing over 800 kids per month. So as far as our numbers to date for Intermountain, this is what we're seeing. And we chose to go all the way down to detectable for the lead care too. Um, and these are the rates that we're seeing. So approximately um, anywhere from five to 6% of the kids are coming up with detectable levels. And this is what really drives it home for people. I'm a visual person and I tell Sean, this is one of my favorite things that he does. The first time he sent it to me, I was like, Jessica, you gotta come over and see this. Um, so this is our um, heat map for the state. So you got Logan up here, you got Ogden here, you got Salt Lake City, and down here St. George. And to zero in a little bit more about where folks are at, so you'll have to forgive me because I'm not from Utah, so I have a little cheater map here. So Logan's up here, you got your Ogden here, here's Salt Lake City, a little downtown area, Tooele's out here. Um, so for us, this really drives it home. Do we have youth lead in Utah? Oh, heck yeah, we do. Absolutely. So as far as just our AP echo and our results, our baseline, we were that 20% that was referenced to earlier about testing our Medicaid kids. Um, and then 2019 to date, for not surprising people that didn't participate, they didn't budge. They're still at the bargain bottom basement 20%. So just in those few short months, we were able to bring the folks that did participate in the ECHO up to 34%. And that's for the entire Medicaid panel. So those are just not the kids that were being seen. So for my particular practice, um, by participating in the ECHO, for the kids that were coming in, we were testing almost 70%, which is amazing to go from 20 to 70. But for these higher panel, it was 34%. And then taking all the practices together across Intermountain, it was the 30%. And so I think we've already answered this question, the Medicaid lead, lead mandate, 12 and 24, gotta do it. And then if they haven't had testing before, then you're supposed to do a catch up one up until the age of six. So you're like, well 20%, that's, that's pretty good, right? Nope. This is what the rest of the country is doing. So they're almost over 70%. We are in the lowest percentile. We get a great big old F in the state of Utah. And I know Utahns, we do things, many things well, but this is one of the things that we need to improve on. Um, and this is one of the questions. So is Medicaid status a risk factor for lead poisoning in Utah? This is the only state I've ever worked in where this is kind of a trick question. So the Department of Health took a look at it, and you can see here that Medicaid status is not a risk factor in Utah for lead poisoning. It's a federal mandate, you've got to do it. But just because you have Medicaid doesn't mean that you're necessarily a risk. So for example, my zip code that I'm in is one of the highest risk zip codes, the avenues, right? If I talk to my neighbors, has your kid ever been tested for lead? No, not even on the radar, not even on the radar. What's that? I know, I, oh, so Clyde's pointing out we, that we don't. Clyde's just pretty much my neighbor. I could throw a rock at her house. Um, but yes, yeah, so some of my friends live up, and then, yeah, my friend's there. But yeah, we live kind of close in the, what is it, Yalewood area. <laughs> just a little bit by the university. And then, um, oh, and I guess y'all are gonna come and toilet paper my house. That'll be real fun. Anyway, what about workflow? That's another big sticking point when implementing this process. Um, so this is the workflow, and these will be in the slides that are given to you later. Um, so for us, we do everybody starting at 12 and 24 months with the point of care testing. And then if the point of care is positive, then um, just positive, not even five, because I think we talked about, you know, there's a little bit of wiggle room. So if it's detectable, we just go ahead and do the venous and go from there. And then there's some of this, the reporting things down at the bottom too as well. And then how much time does it really take? Oh, we got pushed back on this one too um, from some of our physicians. So I always equate this to cooking in the kitchen. And so if anybody's ever done their mama's or their granny's favorite recipe, the first time you do it, it's very linear. We're gonna chop the onions, then we're gonna saute the onions, then we're gonna boil the water, 
right? You know, you do everything. You, then, once you kind of get the recipe, you've, you're boiling the water, you're chopping the onions, you're sauteing things while your meat's out. You know, I mean, you've got different things going on all at once. So it gets better as the time goes on. The actual analyzer itself only takes three minutes. I don't know why it's exactly 178, but around three minutes. And honestly, it gets better as the MA gets, gains, gains experience. Um, so y as you can imagine, that as they um, gain the experience, they're gonna start multitasking with things. So if the point of care is detectable, now what? And so like I said, we get the venous, and this um, is another reference. This isn't, happens to be from up to date, um, kind of what to follow. And, I, and this kind of came up in conversation in the break. I treat a 3.4 the same as a 5.7. I'm still gonna follow up with you. I still give you the same education, the same handouts, and go over everything with you. But what happens if my point of care is detectable, we do the venous, but the venous is fine. So do I just tell the parents they're okay? Like what should I tell the parents? So for me, and this is one of the things that really drove home um, in the AP Echo, this is the perfect time for primary prevention. So you can tell the family, yes, it's in your home, but these are the things that you can do as a mom, as a dad, as a granny, as a grandpa, to reduce that. We like to also go, go back over the lead exposure questionnaire just to see if perhaps there's a hobby that we missed. Um, in Utah, there's a lot of target shooters, and so that's one of the things that tends to pop up. Um, I also like to empower people with what to do. So we talk about the wet mopping, leaving your shoes at the door so you're not trekking in the, the lead dust, washing the hands and the face before they eat, reviewing nutrition, um, because your anemic kids are going to absorb that iron a lot uh, more readily. And then basically recon and to consider testing these kids again down the line, because if it's in their environment now, you say, well, it's not a problem now, but how we just recheck again just to make sure it doesn't become an issue in the future. And I believe these handouts are in your folder. So these are the ones that we give out from the Le uh, Utah Lead Coalition. Um, fantastic, because it really boils it down. Like, what should I be doing? What am I going to worry about? What are some potential sources? as well as nutrition, and then also with Randy Jefferson's group with the Lead, uh, Lead Safe Housing Program, amazing service um, for folks. And they don't even, for one reason, they don't even have to have a child with an elevated lead. They could just request the services. So, and we'll have somebody talk later about that one. This one, is like I said, I'm the queen of overshare. And so I like to share within my personal experience as far as if they want a, a water filter for the fridge, I bought an Amazon fake. So I went on Amazon, I'm the Amazon queen, and it showed up, and I'm looking for the certificate that says what, and I was like, where's my certificate? It's not in here. And then I go back on and I look a little bit closer at it, and all it reduced was odor and chlorine. And I was like, ah, oh, I bought a fake. It looks really great on the Amazon website, so, you know, just to make people aware that there are fakes out there, that not every water filter is created equally. Um, and then also in your handout, you're also gonna have the specific lead questionnaire for Utah. I love this one um, because it includes refugees, includes these hobbies down at the bottom as well. And then I think this question came up um, earlier about the reimbursement. So um, the Meridian folks, they can talk more specifically about this if you wanna, I don't represent Meridian, I don't work for Meridian, um, but they can get you an analyzer for, um, free if you do commit to so many testing per year. And the testing comes out to be around eight to $10 um, per test. And then generally speaking, it is gonna be covered by insurance companies at well, well child checks. So basically there's no charge to the families. And your reimbursement range it ranges anywhere from 13 to $20. Um, at Intermountain, we choose not to um, bill for the capillaries, so there is that potential for an extra three to six dollars if you want to do that as well. Um, the only insurance company thus far that we've run against where they won't cover it is sick visits, like it goes towards their deductible, is Regents um, Blue Cross. But I've been told that that's going to change. So hopefully in the near future that's going to change. And if you need the coatings, it's right there for you. Ah, oh, the sandy water event. <laughs> and so the other big question I get from folks is, um, the Sandy Water event, how did y'all handle it? Wow, 
and I get a help, I get, get by with a little help from my friends, and that, in that case, I get by with a lot of help with, from my friends. So just to bring, um, just kind of jog everyone's memory since it was back in February, um, a snowstorm and a power outage resulted in a fluoride pump malfunction, which sent a massive amount of fluoride into the public water system. So because the fluoride was in there, it leached lead and copper from the pipes. Their best guess is that folks were exposed up to three days. So they, they originally it was one zone, then it went to two zones, and then this is where my blood pressure went up. <laughs> then when we hit the three zones, potentially 8,000 people, some elementary schools, a high school, then that's when my blood pressure really, I was like, oh, okay, all right, this is a lot of people. Um, the highest um, for lead was 394, and the action level is 15. The highest sample for copper at the time was uh, 20, over 28,000, and the action level for copper is only 1,300. So the Salt Lake County Health Department uh, reached out to Intermountain because at the time of the four offices there in Sandy, we were the only folks at that point with a point of care testing, and so they reached out to us, um, us meaning Intermountain. So then I got looped into this long email, email string um, Wednesday night on the 20th. I was like, yeah, we can do this, sure. That sounds good, that's before I heard about the 8,000 people. Um, at the time, it was just a few hundred people. And I was like, yeah, yeah, we can do this, this will be good, we, we can absolutely do this. And then I was already reaching out to my Meridian rep, and so Rachel at that point started pulling machines from Cincinnati, from Boston, she was already starting to um, get them over to us. And um, then Thursday morning, we started having the question, well, we're gonna do this. So Thursday morning, they said, well, let's do it at the hospital, and we'll have corrals. And I just paused, I kind of glazed over. Because as a mom, if you talk to me about corrals, especially with Disneyland, Disney World, I'm like, mm, I can't do corrals, nope. And that's just not the Intermountain way. We're about community, making people feel comfortable with their testing. Um, so I was like, well, how about we do it at the couple offices closest to the event? People come in, and we'll do it here at the office, and we'll just mirror what we already do well, which is at the, um, the flu shot clinic. So basically, with our flu shot clinics, what we do is um, the front desk has a rapid registration for the entire family. Then the entire family goes back to one room, and in one room, we have an MA who administers the flu shot. So for this model, same thing, rapid registration at the front, pull back the entire family to one room where the MA had an analyzer. So that way everybody could get tested um, together at once. So this was the map. Um, this is the latest one that I had available. And so this was the zone one, zone two. And here's where my blood pressure went up, zone three. And like I said, we, um, we had a couple of elementary schools and a high school in there. The other big question that kind of came up during the process was, that Thursday, well, we're, when are we gonna do it? And so somebody tossed up there, well, we don't have enough time, let's just do it in a week and a half, we'll do it, not this Saturday, but the following one, I was like, ooh. As a mom, if you told me my baby was exposed to lead, I am worried to bits. And I was like, we just, we just need to do this, we're gonna do it, and let's do it Saturday, and we're, we're just gonna make it happen, it's just gonna happen. And so I'm sure they thought, ooh, this crazy girl from Texas, okay, and so, but so we chose that, that Saturday. So in one and a half days, <laughs> we, we were able to pull off um, uh, getting the free lead testing event going. So testing the community is only a day and a half preparation. Um, so Rachel was able to get first from Meridian. She was able to get us over 22 analyzers and we were able to order um, 2,400 tests because we really didn't know how many of these 8,000 people would need to be tested or had already been tested. So yeah, my practice manager called me whenever she said, um, Liz, do you realize you just ordered $16,000 worth of tests? I was like, yes, ma'am, I do. Thank you, yes. <laughs> and so she was able to get that purchase order through for me. Um, the Department of Health helped us with the command center, so people called into the command center to schedule uh, lead testing appointments and to kind of um, be the triage, like do you, do you live in one of the zones? We later opened this up to just walk-ins, and we also opened it up because one of the big questions we received from families, well, what happens if my child attends one of those schools in the zone, but we don't live in that zone? And so, me being me, I was like, come on in, we'll get you tested. 
And so we included those folks as well. We went over the uh, utilized or rapid registration um, in the one analyzer per room mirroring our flu clinic. We also had IT on hand as well as folks from blood care too. They were super awesome. They even flew somebody in for this event to help out um, just to answer questions in case we had an analyzer go down. And um, a lot of community-led champions were there to answer questions, address concerns, and everyone that was tested walked away with the flyers that in y'all's um, folders. So everyone received that. So the lead results on that Saturday with the day and a half preparation, we were able to screen 521 people. We were, we were thinking maybe 1,000 might show up. We weren't sure, so um, I was really proud of our MAs and the staff. They did an amazing job. Um, they really got people in and were able to reassure them. Um, so over the next two weeks, because again, like I said, we opened it up just walk-ins and people to come in. We offered all this free of charge. We were able to test over 704 people. Um, 29 of the folks had detectable levels. Um, so those people were offered venous. Not everyone chose to do the venous. Um, if you got a venous sample done, you got a call from me. Um, and so I called everybody with those results. And I should go back and say that the 29 detectable capillary levels, if you had a detectable level, then you got to, you got to chat with a doctor that, like, that was there. So I was over at the Holiday office, Dr. Fruin and Dr. Davis, they were over at the Sandy office, you know, just to talk about concerns that the parents might have. <coughs> Our highest venous level was only 5.1, and it was the grandmother um, in an older home. Uh, she had two grandchildren in the home, and the grandkids were fine. We had one gentleman um, who came in, his capillary was seven, and his venous was 3.5. He's a 68-year-old, and he was a target shooter. He liked using pure lead bullets, and he liked cleaning his gun without um, gloves, and he actually gone target shooting only five days prior. And after chatting with him on the phone, he was adorable, and he's like, I will change my ways for my grandchildren. I was like, thank you, sir. <laughs> so he was a pleasure to speak to. <coughs> Excuse me. And the big learning point for me, because there was a lot of 2 a.m. emails that were flying around, um, and things that kept, kept me up at night. I was like, oh my goodness, but what about the babies on formula, right? And so as, you know, as I processed through this as a pediatrician and mother, um, that was kind of the things that, that came up to me. And so Dr. Alan Wolf, he's over at Harvard and also works with one of the pediatric environmental health units. And he's like, Liz, it's the dose, but the duration as well. And so this is one, one of the things that he had sent over to me. And so keep in mind, our lead water, um, we were down here at 394. So this was an example that he was using with a child where if it was 80 in a school and the child was drinking um, 0.3 liters per day, we're still below five. I was like, okay, all right. And so that, that really helped me a lot. So lessons learned from this is, um, you know, it feels like the Boy Scouts. So always be prepared for it. Um, it was nice that we had the point of care testing, so we were able to offer that to the families. And the power of yes and momentum, I still go back that it was because of Dr. Fruin's lecture and Dr. Wagner saying yes, that it got that initial ball rolling, and then I could just, I came in, kept it a little bit going, a little squeaky wheel, and then just kept the ball moving forward. So y'all are also part of that momentum with creating lead testing here in Utah to continue to make it, make those um, heat maps even more accurate so we can concentrate our outreach and our um, education as well. Build upon what you already do well like we did with our flu shot clinic. Involve your a action A team and community partners as early in the process as possible. So for us, it was the MAs and the practice managers. A quick response to commun concern community is best. People really appreciated the fact that, you know, we were able to come in and say, all right, we're offering testing and it's this Saturday. Families really enjoyed that. Um, the importance of being the neutral medical professional. It was nice whenever I gave, the, gave out those phone calls to the folks, and they were like, well, I know you're not with the water department, but, and then they would give me an earful, but it was nice that I got to be the neutral medical professional in it. Coming from a mama standpoint, empowering families, because again, lead let exposure feels scary, um, just with, those, with the, some of the hounds out we have. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, don't forget about the animals. I had one of this, he was a farmer, 
and a rancher and he gave me questions. Apparently cows and horses drink a lot of water here in Utah. I did not know that. And sheep apparently are affected by copper more than other animals. Um, and so the poison control numbers for animal poison controlling is there in case you'll ever need it. And like I said, don't ever mess with Utah grandmas and grandpas. I have a feeling that, you know, my Mima is somehow related to Utah because these are feisty folks and I just love them to bits. So when I say a little help from my friends, it was a lot of help from my friends. And so these are the folks that helped out with this um, from anywhere from Lead Care to Dr. Fuin, to, from Mary Jean Brown to Dr. Sean Soison, and just everybody, the, the coalition that kind of came together to make this happen. See, these are some pictures from the day. So that's Dr. Davis and Dr. Fruin, and this is over um, at the Sandy office. And this is one of my favorite quotes that I want to leave with y'all. Um, and if you ever, like I said, if you ever need anything when you're rolling this out with your practice, please reach out to me if you hit any hiccups, um, any barriers, and I will help you through it as best I can. <laughs>